Was that my fault? <laughs> Thank you, my personal Barnabas. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll have a response time now. You can come and uh, accept Jesus or not, and then just go home. Um, oh goodness! Choices. You know, they come in all shapes and sizes, all colors and flavors. Uh, they are in our every moment. Uh, choices, choices, choices. Uh, I, I thought uh, Jeremy did a really great job last week of uh, talking about the cereals and the different choices on, on the aisle. And as he said last week, we have this tendency to think that we have multiple choices ahead of us. But the reality, as his sermon pointed out last week, as the message pointed out last week, we really only have a couple of choices in life to make. Perhaps there's no bigger choice than the choice we face every day as to who we will be. That one choice alone is something that most of us have been trying to figure out, uh, if we're honest, uh, for most of our life. Uh, I can remember when I was a young warthog. You're supposed to respond. You've seen The Lion King. Come on. Oh, my goodness. I went to all that effort and, and put myself out there, and you won't even participate. I appreciate that. You're supposed to go, when he was a young warthog. Uh, oh, people. I'm going to pray for y'all. No, I'm not doing it again. I'm done. <laughs> oh, but when I was young... I dealt with the issue of trying to live up to everybody's expectations. There was mom and dad who expected me to behave and, as, a, as a good boy. Um, as I shared before, I really wasn't raised in a Christian home. I was raised in a home with Christian Judeo values, but those values were attached to what good boys and good girls do. I was taught how to be a good American, and good Americans kind of follow along this pseudo-Christian values. Uh, this is what it looks like to be good. And, and, and I, I struggled with, the, with those type of things to make my, my parents proud of me. Uh, there was the issues at school. Um, you know, I was expected to behave and to be a good student. Uh, and I struggled with, with those types of things because, not that I want to be a bad student, but, but just trying to live up to the expectations of my teachers. Uh, how to act, how to behave, how to engage and get the things done that need to be done. Uh, there was the expectations that uh, were kind of unfair sometimes. Uh, I have never been a small person uh, in, in girth or in height. And I can remember being in the third grade and being the tallest boy in, in school and having to walk the sixth grade homecoming queen uh, down the aisle at the elementary school. Uh, you are shaking your head and acting like that's an awesome thing. It wasn't for a third grader. <laughs> I didn't like girls. They were nasty. They had cooties. Uh, and, you know, and I had, to, I had to put myself out there and walk down the aisle of uh, the middle of the gym uh, with, this, with this sixth grade girl. Yuck. Just trying to figure out who you're going to be. You know, it's funny. I look back on my life now. And I can see where God was making it very clear who I was supposed to be as I look back and I look at that journey. But when I was in the middle of that journey, I had no clue, no idea. Trying to fit in, trying to find myself, trying to discover my identity, who I was. And like I said, as I look back into that life, that journey, I can see that it was always on this trajectory. But it does boil down to choices, what choices you make. Today, as Jesus wraps up his Sermon on the Mount, and let me tell you, we, this is kind of an odd, an odd series we're in. We're finishing the Sermon on the Mount today. This is, this is where Jesus ends it. This is his call, his response. We've come to the end of the service, and he steps up, and he's fixing to pray, and he's saying, here's what I want you to do. We're going to do that in a few moments. But this is not the end of our series. Jeremy's going to come back next week and wrap our series up as we circle back around to the beginning and wrap it up by looking at where we started at. But today, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he challenges you and he challenges me to answer one simple question. Who will you be? Let's pray. Father God, I, I, we come before your throne this morning. 
praising you for who you are, praising you for what you're doing in our lives, praising you for what you're doing in your kingdom, praising you for the way your hand is sovereign in all things, even if we don't see it all the time. Lord, we, we thank you and we praise you for your grace, your mercy, your compassion, your peace. But thank you that you're a loving God, a faithful God, a patient God. This morning, would you tarry with us for a few moments? Would you open our eyes, open our ears, bend our hearts in such a way that we not only hear the words, but Lord, we, we, we meditate upon them. We, 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 we draw them into our lives. We, we live in the midst of them so they can transform our lives. Lord, help us this morning to understand the choice in front of us and to choose wisely. For I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our choices. As Jesus wraps up this sermon, he gives his listeners a choice. Will they be real disciples or will they be nominal disciples? That is, will they really embrace what Jesus is talking about or will they just hit the surface? Kind of like the way I was brought up in this Americanized Christianity of what good people look like. Not righteous people. Not people sold out for Jesus. But people who are just checking the boxes. Making sure everything's okay. This message really hinges, the, the whole sermon really hinges back on a passage Jesus, uh, that, that Jeremy preached on, not Jesus, Jeremy, Jeremy preached on a few weeks back. Where we talked about your treasures and where they're, where they're stored at, where they're hidden. And, and Jeremy, preaching from, from Jesus' words, reminded us that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon being not just money, but mammon being the ways of this world, the material things of this world. You can't serve both. You can't have a foot in both worlds. You can't try to please both masters because you'll love one and you'll hate the other. And let me tell you, you won't hate the world. You'll despise God because he's holding you back. He's not letting you have what you want. He's stopping you from having all the fun that the world offers. Or at least it seems that way when you're trying to serve both. But when your feet are solidly planted in the gospel of Christ, and you understand that you're just a visitor in this material world, and yes, stuff's okay, stuff's not bad, money's not bad, but it's not the thing you're trying to, to get. It's not the thing that your heart seeks after. That's when you'll find true happiness. You can't serve two masters. We're called to choose wisely. Jesus' followers make choices every day. And these choices either lead to life or they lead to destruction. The difference between life and death is not what a person hears or says they believe, but rather what they actually do. Now let me unpack that for a quick moment. Because it does matter what you say. But it only matters if your actions back it up. Don't tell me you believe in the Word of God and then you live your life in a way that's contrary to it. Don't tell me that you believe that, that Jesus is the, the only way, but your life doesn't reflect that philosophy because you're chasing after a bunch of different things. To live the blessed life is to follow Jesus with a wholehearted, true commitment to Him. And this is what Jesus is calling His listeners to at the end of this sermon. Uh, now, he does not speak a new truth to the people. In fact, he calls, uh, his call to respond is rooted in, in the depths of the Old Testament. Just to give you a couple quick verses here. Basically, basically, there are two ways that lie before the people of God. Deuteronomy 30, 19. It says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Again in Psalm chapter 1, verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Jeremiah 21, verse 8. But tell the people, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am setting before you the way of life 
in the way of death. God has been calling His people to make this choice from time eternal. You have to decide who you're going to follow. Jesus spends these last 17 verses encouraging us to choose and to choose carefully. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start with verse 13. I know Jeremy covered verse 13 and 14 last week, but uh, we've got to go back up and pick, pick 13 and 14 up. Uh, while you're turning there, um, let, me, let me teach you a little something this morning. Uh, some of you may already, already know this. This may be old news to some of you. This may be the first time that you hear some of this. But when you're studying your Bible, when you're opening up Scripture and you're reading, a couple things to pay attention to. One, definitely pay attention to the story. What's being, what's being shared. For example, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a flow of information. There's, a, there's a, a, a things that Jesus is communicating. We need to hear those. But there's also an author. A human author who's writing to a human audience. And he's arranged the information in such a way that it communicates something to us as well. What is the author's intent and also what is God's intent? They, they work together. As God has used men to write the Bible, he has impressed upon them the need to write these things, but he's used them to write to specific people at specific times with specific intentions. And we see one of those intentions here because we're going to look at, at four different, really five, actually the whole sermon is set up this way, but, but at least four different in this message this morning, four different different. Patterns, four, or four, the same patterns, four, four couplets. He's going to repeat this idea of two. There are two this, there are two that, there are two this, there are two that. It kind of goes back to you cannot serve two masters. He wants us to, he wants us to understand that, that this is important. It's important enough that I'm going to repeat it several different times in several different ways, but you need to hear this. It's not just a, a nice little pattern that we're using for the, the purpose of preaching a message. But this is important. Just in case you missed it the first time, let me double back. Oh, you didn't get it the second time? Let me tell you again. Third time, it's this repetitious pattern that lets us know that this is important. And it all goes back to this question, who will you be? Choose carefully, because there are two ways. Uh, look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Like I said, Jeremy did a great job of covering this last week, but let me just hit on a few things this morning. We have the broad way and we have the narrow way. The broad way is the easy way. It's the obvious way. It's easily drifted into. Did you hear that? It is easily drifted into. You don't even have to be intentional. You can just be doing life. And before you know it, you're caught in the flow of the broad way. Many travel this path. And that's probably why it's easy to drift into, because that's where everybody seems to be going. Then you have the narrow way. It's the difficult way. It's obscure. It's not so easy to navigate. Very few people travel this path. If you really break down that, that passage, when it says few, it means very few. Very few people travel this path. To travel it requires intentional effort. More than likely, uh, church historians believe that this is where the early church took its name from, the way. Uh, we find in the book of Acts, Acts 9, Acts 19, Acts 22, Acts 24, that the church is called the way. This is probably where that name came from. Following the way, the narrow way, being different, doing something unique, being intentional on how we're going to live our lives, living outside of the norm. They latch on to this, this, this description, this title, as their identity. It's actually one of the many reasons I believe that the Sermon on the Mount was not just a, a one-time sermon. This is, my, this is probably a sermon that Jesus preached multiple times, either in its entirety or in parts of it, as he traveled the land. 
talking about the kingdom of God. Because when, when the church begins to formulate, it, it, this, is the, this is where they went to. For what to call themselves, what to figure who they were. We're the way. Not necessarily the way to Jesus, they're that. But we're following the way. The narrow path. We're doing what Jesus told us to do. Uh, these ways are, are like paths. The way is like a path that I've encountered before when I've been, I've been backpacking. Uh, don't laugh. I used to actually do activity. Uh, Debbie can attest to it. I did at least once, right? Yeah, she nodded her head. I exercise, I exercise every now and then. Uh, but when I used to backpack, I can remember one backpacking trip with, with, with Duncan. Uh, we were with the scouts, and we were we were we were headed down into the southern uh, or the northern mountains of Georgia, and that's the, that's the kind of the foothills of, of, of the Smoky Mountains. The Smoky Mountains is probably one of the, the steepest terrains in the Appalachian Mountain Range, uh, and we were kind of in the the middle part of it. And I can remember there was an easy way to get to the campground. I voted for that one. It was a nice gravel dirt path that was well, well, de well defined. It, had, it actually had little bitty uh, landscaping timbers down the side of it uh, so that you wouldn't get lost. It took about six miles to get there on that, but I was, I was willing to walk six miles. The not so easy path cut up and over. It was only three miles, but it was not as easily defined. They didn't have nice landscaping timbers down the edges of it. It wasn't graveled or dirt. It was rock and root and, and bad dirt, and not packed dirt. And I can remember the, uh, the, the scout troop decided we were going to go over, over the mountain and not around it. And we went over the mountain. On that path, well, let me just tell you about the path. One, not well marked. You had to pay attention because it would be very easy to find yourself off the path in any given moment. You know how you find uh, markers, trail markers on, on, on a backpacking trip up the mountains? You gotta look down the, uh, down the trail, and hopefully it's well enough defined that you can figure it out. But on a tree down there someplace, will be a little bit of emblem carved into the tree. And you just hope that someone's been there recently to recut the, uh, the emblem out. Because <laughs> if not, you're gonna think you saw an emblem, but it was just a tree with a weird design, and before you know it, you're out in the woods someplace and you don't know where you're at. And you turn around to look for the, uh, the, the, the patterns behind you, and there are none. You have to be intentional. You have to be focused. You have to stay on the path. Uh, this path was very narrow. It had roots and rocks and all sorts of obstacles. It was not well maintained. You had to pick your feet up. Uh, I'm not a foot picker up person. I'm a foot shuffler person. You want to guess how many times I failed? A few stumbled. Isn't it the way life on the path is, the narrow way? You stumble, maybe sometimes you fall. You know, as I was thinking about this illustration, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good illustration because, you know, when I fell over and I had that 50-pound pack on my back, I couldn't get up. Guess what I had to depend upon? A bunch of 14-year-old boys <laughs> to pick me up. <laughs> that was quite uh, a sight. But I had to depend on somebody else to help me. Um, it was washed. We, we, got, we got to one part where there was a gully. The gully was about 15 foot deep and about uh, 7 foot wide. And it was washed out. Uh, we were supposed to have a, a little bitty footbridge that went across it. And that thing had washed out and fallen into the hole, the gully. And we had to take our packs off. And you had to throw your pack across. And if it didn't make it across, it fell down into this gully where it was muddy and nasty and dirty. Then we had to work our way down with ropes and work our way back up to the side of the ropes. It wasn't easy to navigate, but it led to the campsite. The narrow path is also like swimming against a strong current. Uh, anybody ever been caught in a current before? You're swimming against a current. Can, can you really swim against a strong current? No, you got to go back and forth. You got to work your way up. It takes effort. Uh, I can remember back when I uh, would be canoeing back as a kid with my, with my dad, and we, we'd get out into the, uh, the, the river, and we would just mess around. It's so easy to get swept around, swept, swept back downstream with the current because you have to be intentional about how you get against the current. That's kind of what Jeremy pointed out last week. 
But this narrow path, maybe this isn't necessarily a hiking path, but maybe it's more like swimming in the culture that we live in. Navigating through all of the junk. You know, sometimes even when you're swimming against the current, the current's taking you downriver. In either case, hiking in the mountains or swimming in a strong current, you have to be intentional. You have to have a plan. You must know what the goal is. Oh, and by the way, there are two ways even in church life, folks. There's a broad way in church life. Cheap, easy believism. Saying that you believe in the things of the Bible, saying you believe in the things of God, but your lifestyle doesn't back it up. People who say they're Christians. I don't like the title Christian. I like the title disciple. Follower. A lot of people say they're Christians. But are you following Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you learning what he's taught and applying it to your life? That's the narrow way of church life. That your finances, that your marriage, that your parenting, that your work life, that your habits, that your language, that, that the things that you do and you don't do, that they're, they're, they back up what the Bible teaches, what God's Word says to do. That if someone looked at you and they really had to judge who you were and they didn't have titles, what side would you fall on? A good person or a godly person? And they're not the same. Who do you be? Choose carefully. There are two voices. Two voices. Verses 15 through 20. It says this. Be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Did you hear that? A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Uh, my parents were supposed to be here this morning. Thank goodness they didn't come. Because I have a confession to make. Mama was right. Don't tell her I said that. They don't know how to work the computer stuff, so they'll never catch this on the online. Mama was right. Be careful who you hang out with and what you hang around. The voices in your life will shape your thoughts and direct your actions. There's just no way around it. Carefully choose the voice that you listen to. Notice what Jesus says. He says, be on guard. Be vigilant. Be at the ready. It's like a soldier who is not at ease, but he's got his shield up. He's got his hand on his sword. He's ready for whatever is fixing to come. He's watching. He's paying attention. He's on guard. Not just to what's in front of him, but to the sides and behind. He is aware of his surroundings. It's easy to identify the obvious threats. But there are those that move against us that are not our friends. But they act like they are. Jesus says they are like wolves in sheep's clothing. That is, they look meek, they look mild, they look like one of us. They profess to be one of us. But their actions are like a ravenous wolf. Who they really are inside. I like the way Jesus says that. Their inward being, their identity, who they are. They are not a sheep, but they're a wolf. Not just any type of wolf, a ravenous wolf. A wolf that desires to do one thing and one thing only. To get into the sheep pen and to cause as much destruction and as much damage as possible. Ripping the sheep apart. Tearing them apart. Devouring them. This has been the situation for the church since the church began. 
that we've had enemies, not just without, but we've had enemies within. And we're called to determine what we're listening to. You know, in a, in a world where we want to be liked, in a world where we want to belong, in a world where we want to get along, in a world where we don't want to be that voice that is ah, too harsh. Yeah, God says this, but did He really mean that? Isn't God love? And doesn't He love everybody? In a world where we want to be so accepted, we're listening to the wrong voices. That's not that we're supposed to be mean and hateful and harsh. We're supposed to be compassionate, kind, and loving. But we're supposed to hold to a standard of what God's Word says. You see, back in Jesus' day, there were a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of religious people, who professed to believe in God, Torah, law. They did all the right things. They went to the temple. They gave their money. They gave their time. They behaved on the Sabbath day. But when it came down to it, their hearts were not bent towards the things of God because they looked down upon those who were hurting. They despised those who were in need. They weren't about going to the people, but the people could come to them. And if they got everything checked off on the boxes and marks and got their lives right, they could join us. That's not who God has called us to be. That idea of let's build it and they will come is straight out of hell, folks. We're not supposed to build anything. Jesus has built his kingdom. We're supposed to go and live in it. Not living like they live, living differently on a narrow path. Listening to the voices that are challenging us, encouraging us, and being a voice that challenges and encourages. This inward nature is, is true no matter what they appear like, these ravenous wolves. They can't help it. That's who they are. How do we recognize them? Jesus makes it real simple. By their fruit. What are they doing? What's being produced? Let's just deal with the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. Is there real biblical love? Real biblical joy? Do they show patience, kindness? Do we see self-control? Or do we see what the world says is love? The world says the, the love is to do what you want to. Be happy. That's what loving is. Just be actualized. Be you. Jesus says you can tell what type of tree you're around by the fruit it bears. And notice this. Good trees can't help but produce good fruit. It's who they are. Believers in Jesus can't help but do Jesus things. It's who they are. Even when they mess up, they're convicted by this word. And it draws them back into a right relationship. Even when they stumble, maybe because of some outward experience or maybe because of some inward sin, when we, the brothers and sisters of Christ, surround them, and not just pick them back up, but pick them back up with a challenge of repentance and restoration, they hear it. They're not offended. They're not mad at you. They're not mad at me. They're not going to take their toys and go to another church because y'all just don't love me. They understand. They're convicted by God's Spirit. And they get back into alignment. Folks, this is a tough message this morning. There's no way around it. What voice are you going to listen to? Remember, if, if, if a tree isn't producing good fruit, it's, it's useless. It's not good for anything. And Jesus himself says this. He says, remember, we started this sermon off, the series off. If the salt loses its saltiness, what's it good for? To be trampled underfoot. 
for nothing. Now let me be very clear, so I just made a very bold statement. God does call us to leave sometimes. But if God's doing the calling, follow God. But if we're doing the leaving of the family because of our sinfulness, that's not of God. He's called us to live together and to help one another. How can you judge what is good fruit or bad fruit? Uh, I, I was kind of chuckling as I thought about this this week. Last week uh, at our small group, uh, we'd finished small group, we walked outside, and we have a rose bush right outside our small group. Uh, uh, not our small our house, not our small group. <laughs> it doesn't follow our small group around. Uh, that'd be kind of weird, uh, but it's outside our house. So we're out there, we're standing, and this, this rose bush is just about dead. Uh, Steve and Kim can give uh, a, a, a testimony to that. Uh, it's, it started blooming this week, though. It's had like six blooms on it. But, but Last year, a windstorm came along and pushed it over, and, and it took some of the roots and pulled them up. And, and part of the, the bush is dead. And I was telling, uh, saying something, hey, I'm going to have to get out here and, and just call this dead stuff out. Well, Debbie goes, oh, no, you can't. It's not dead. It's, it's still, and we're sitting there, and we're just, you know, bending it over. It's, you know, it's falling off brittle. Uh, <laughs> you can tell what parts are dead and what parts aren't. But we had a discussion. Uh, <laughs> And the Lord proved me right this week by allowing it to bloom. Amen? <laughs> it's one of the few times I've been right. Uh, but you know, how do you tell what a good plant is or a bad plant? You tell by what it's producing. It's easy right now to see what parts of the, of the rose bush are bad. Because they're not producing. They need to be pruned. And what do you do with the parts that are pruned? Replant them? No, you toss them. Put them in the burn pile. And get rid of them. Do you really want to know what God's Word says? This is how we judge these voices. You need to, under, you need to be under a steady intake of God's Word. Jeff said this a couple of weeks ago, and he, he hit it right on the, on, the, on the nail's head. We're like broken records. We keep telling you all the same thing. It's real simple. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Read His Word. It's not going to jump out and say, Hey, Matthew, I want you to do this. But what it's going to do, though, is going to align your spirit with God's spirit. And He'll start talking to you through His Word. And you'll understand what moves and changes and transformations need to take place in your life. You need to be under a steady intake of God's Word. You need to read it, listen to it, and wrestle with it. You need to be in a small group of people who are studying God's Word together so that you don't make the mistake of hearing your own voice that may not be where it needs to be at. You need to have an accountability group, a, a group of guys if you're a guy, a group of gals if you're a gal, who are holding you accountable to live out that Word. We're not called to do this alone. We need one another. And probably the big question here is, what kind of fruit are you? Are you a thriving vineyard of grapes? Or are you a thick thistle of thorns? Who will you be? Choose carefully. There are two destinations. 21 and 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. These two voices that desire to tempt us to one of two paths, they lead to two destinations. It's not one or the other is not a multiple destinations. You either go to one or you head to the other. You're on a, a designated path. When the kingdom of heaven comes, it is not your verbal profession that counts, but rather your verbal profession shows or is shown in the way or the manner in which you have lived your life. That's what will matter. It's the old saying, put your money where your mouth is. Let your actions prove what you're saying. It's easy to profess loyalty, faithfulness, but to practice loyalty is another thing altogether. Uh, 
again, I, I think of the illustration of the four friends. Uh, we find it in, in the Gospel of Mark. The four friends, you remember them. Uh, they bring the paralytic to, uh, to Jesus. These four friends, the story, uh, there, there are three different types of people in this story that just jump out at me right away. That talks about, about, about the, the faithfulness to, to do what they need to do. You get the friends, you know, it, it, it'd be easy to say, hey, Jesus is a healer, Jesus uh, you, you know, can do these things, but they actually took their friend to Jesus and at great effort got their friend in the presence of Jesus because they just didn't say it, they believed it to the point they acted on it. You got Jesus in the paralytic, you know, and, and, and Jesus says, uh, your sins are forgiven. And everybody kind of scoffs. And Jesus says, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But well, we know it's easier to say. Your sins are forgiven. You don't have to prove that necessarily. But Jesus goes, just so you know, I can do what I said. I can get your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. And the paralytic got up and walked. Then you get the Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees. I hate to say it, but I probably would have been one of them. It's easy to say you know God and you know His Word. But when push comes to shove and God's miracles are happen, happening right in front of them, difficult to believe. That was the Pharisees. Words are not enough. These people, they come to Jesus and they cry out, Lord, Lord. And this is not the Lord like, Sir, Sir. This is Lord, Jesus, Master. Messiah, Lord, Lord, we're here. Hallelujah. And Jesus goes, who are you? Or we're the ones that have been doing all these things. And I've, I've talked on this passage before. It's one of the scariest passages in the Bible to me. Because these people really thought they had it. And they're doing things I've never done. They're healing people. I use band-aids. They're casting out demons. I've got Duncan. Close, but not cracker. They're, 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 they're awesome. But Jesus makes a statement. Even though you call me Lord, even though you do these things, if you aren't doing the will of my Father in heaven, there's no place for you in my kingdom. Depart. Get out. Be gone. And this isn't just kicking someone out of this building. This is be gone from eternity. Be gone and cast into the fires of hell. I never knew you. How many people who call themselves Christians are running in a path chasing all the wrong things? thinking that they're doing the Father's will, but really they're just doing their will. It's about themselves. It's about making themselves look good. It's about doing what's right. It's about being good. You know, one of the saddest things, and I look back at this, and, 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 and I've had this conversation with my parents. They would agree. But one of the saddest things in my life, I was never taught to be pure. Sexually pure. <laughs> mentally pure. I was taught not to get caught. I wasn't taught to save myself from marriage because this was what was honoring to God. Or to be honoring to my spouse. But I was taught not to knock a girl up because it would ruin your life. You might get a disease that would ruin your life. And besides, good boys don't do this. Your reputation. Yeah, reputations can be run. Diseases happen. Babies are born out of wedlock. But that's not the reason you stay pure. You stay pure because it's what God has said to do. It's what honors him the most. It's what honors your future spouse the most. It's what honors your relationship with Jesus the most. And it's not just this thing. It's about purity altogether. A whole different conversation for a whole different sermon. 
But I was taught how not to get caught. I wasn't taught how to follow Jesus. I, I know now the answer is I wouldn't have to worry about being one of these people because my heart is bent in a different way. But I look back at my actions as a young believer and I wonder if I hadn't made the right choices, if God hadn't directed my path, if I might be one of these people standing before him one day saying, Lord, Lord, I got saved when I was nine. They dunked me in the, 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 the pool. I've been at church almost every time the doors are open. And Jesus will look at me and say, but I don't know you. The fruit you've produced is not good fruit. I'm afraid our churches may be filled with people like that. Words are not enough. What is enough? To do the Father's will. Let's break that down real fast. Two things there. To do. Action. Activity. It's not just showing up and learning a bunch of stuff. It's not about just falling away. The church has been really good at information dumping and information gathering. We've got all the facts stored away. But are they making a difference in your life? Are you living your life differently? Is your checkbook showing a difference in your life? Does your relationship and your marriage show a difference in your life? Does your language show a difference in your life? Does your habits, do your habits show a difference in your life? Do the, does the way you live your life every day, does it show Jesus or does it just show a good boy or a good girl to do and to do what to do the father's will here's the father's will the father wants you to be obedient and to be faithful to be holy like he is holy what about it are you just full of hot air talking about the things of the faith or do your actions the actions of your life back up the words that escape your lips. And do those actions reflect the heart of God? Choose carefully. Who will you be? Choose carefully. There are two foundations. We're bringing this plane in, folks. Hang with me. Jesus kind of, Jesus kind of, this is, this is kind of a hard-hitting passage right here. Jesus says, therefore, verse 24, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and, the, and they pounded the house. Yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house, and it collapsed, and its collapse, it collapsed with a great crash. And this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is where he ends it. I've, I've told you to be the salt, the light, the city on the hill. We talked about how to shine your light. We talked about what the, what the salt of God's word is. You've heard it said these things, but I tell you, here's God's intention. Uh, here's how you live your life out. You've got choices to make, and here's what it boils down to. If you do what I have told you to do, you are mine. But if you don't, your house is going to fall. Two ways, two voices, two destinations all lead to this one overarching nugget of truth. We must act in accordance with God's teachings. It's one thing to hear what he said and even to approve it. Yes, I believe. But it's another thing to obey it and to do it. And it's only obedience that results in solid achievement. Who will you be? It's really about understanding who you are. Who are you in Christ? There's a lot of different ways we could go with this this morning. I'm going to go this route. God calls His people to be a holy people. Be holy for the Lord your God is holy. We find that in Leviticus 19, Leviticus 20, Leviticus 21, Exodus 19, 1 Peter 1, 1 Thessalonians 4. That's just to name a few. It's a repeating theme through the Old Testament and the New Testament. You be holy because I am holy, God says. But here's the problem. There are a couple of ways to look at holiness. One way that we look at holiness, and we talk about this all the time in church life, is to be distinct, separate, because God is not like us. That's, that's, a, that's a big ask. But the root, the Hebrew root for the word holy also can mean faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful. 
He's the same today that He was yesterday, that He'll be tomorrow. He doesn't change. There is no darkness in God, but only light. He is love. His love has a demanding side where His wrath comes out of, but His love has a compassionate side where His forgiveness and repentance and restoration takes place. He is faithful to His Word. If He said it, He'll do it. And that's what God calls us to be. A faithful people. You be faithful because I am faithful. Now, can I be as faithful as God? No. But I can be a whole lot more in tune with faithfulness than being distinct and separate. Oh, by the way, if you're faithful, guess what you're going to be? Distinct and separate. Is this your identity? That you are faithful to God no matter what. That your faithfulness is made manifest in your obedience. So that when the storms of this broken world rage against your house, your faith, that it stands. Or is your faith found lacking? And when the rivers, the rains, and the storms, and the winds come, your house doesn't stand because it's not built on a faithful understanding of God's Word. It's easy to say that you're a follower of Jesus. It's easy to show up to church on a regular basis. It's easy to say you believe the Bible. But do your actions give evidence to the foundation of your convictions? What does your home life, your marriage, say about your foundation? What does your checkbook, your bank account say about the, your foundation? What does your calendar say about your foundation? The things you invest in. Who will you be? Choose carefully. There is only one authority. Notice uh, that chapter ends with, with this statement, verses 28 and 29. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them like one who had authority, not like their scribes. When Jesus taught, he didn't refer back to what everybody else said. He taught as if he knew what he was talking about. And the only source that he went back to was his words, His truth. While there may be two paths, two voices, two destinations, two foundations, there is only one authority, one truth. And His name is Jesus. And we are called to have our identity, our full identity in Him. To live His truth, not our truth or the world's truth. Remember, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either love the one or you'll hate the other. Who will you be? I can't help but think back to where we started several weeks ago. To live the blessed life is to understand who we are in Christ. To follow Him without question. He's told us that we're the salt. That we're the, we're the preserving nature of this world as we're living out our faith. Shining our light. You are the light. Shining our light, His light, into this dark, broken world. And you are the city. Not just a city in the sense of a destination, but you are the beacon. You're the thing standing on the hill that is crying out to this broken world. There is a God. Because I am the light. I am the salt that reflects who Jesus is. I think it was that same opening message where I shared that silly, silly story about years ago when I was a minister of education in Nashville. And I was at a, a training conference, and our state leader got up, and as he's concluding his the story where he got down in the face of a little dog, and he talked about every day when he leaves his home, he looks at his dog, and he, he shakes his little face. And he says, now you be the dog. This stupid story. It stuck with me for too many years. Because he goes, you be the dog, you be the dog. What else is he going to be? He's a dog. He licks things and he sniffs things and he runs around and he's a dog he's going to do dog things of course he's the dog and he you be the dog and he looks and goes you be the minister of education boom hate that story but it's so stinking true a dog can't be anything but a dog You be the city on the hill. You be the thing that is crying out to the world. There is a God. You be the city on the hill that is reflecting who God is in your life. 
You got to choose which path you're going to take. You got to choose what voices you're going to listen to. You got to choose what your destination is. And that is just not empty words. You got to choose where you're building the foundation of your life. You got to choose. Who are you going to be? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for being a good and faithful and gracious God. But there are so many things, so many awesome things I, I want to proclaim about you this morning. But there's just not enough time. God, I thank you for, in my life that you put me on the right path. Lord, that you called me and sent the right voices into my life. Lord, that you have, have, have put out the destination that I need to be. And Lord, you have convicted my heart to build the foundation of my life on the solid rock. Lord, there have been storms, there have been rains, there have been winds, there have been, been streams that have sought to batter my life down, my faith. But Lord, your word, your truth, holds steady. Lord, thank you. And Lord, I'm certain there are probably that prayer being echoed around this room this morning. But Lord, maybe there's some of us here this morning who know that we profess certain things, we say we believe, but if we were honest, if we were honest, our lives don't reflect it. It's not that we're not producing good fruit. It's not that we're producing bad fruit. Maybe we're just not producing fruit at all. Lord, you have told us that our lives will produce fruit. Lord, this morning my prayer would be for those. If that's where they find themselves, just where they're at, or to come forward. Lord, just to pray and ask for forgiveness. Repent. Seek restoration. To begin to make the right choices. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we have this moment. In the name of Jesus, amen.